Okay, so everybody probably got a little message saying uh, the recording is in progress. Okay, so there we go. Now we can get started. Um, so the purpose of this deep dive is really just to have a conversation about ways that we can expedite the transfer of research into practice. Um, this was one of the main goals of the XR Access Initiative. So um, for any of you who don't know, so I co-founded XR Access with Larry Goldberg. And um, the idea was really just to make sure that XR is, is born accessible um, across the board. So we don't want another repeat of what happened with mobile devices and basically every other technology where the technology becomes ubiquitous and only then everyone suddenly realizes, oh wait, this is not accessible to people with disabilities. People with disabilities are having major problems like at work and in other um, sectors of life because they're not able to use the new technology. So we wanted to make sure that this time around we do things differently and we make sure that we're addressing all the important open questions about how to make the technology accessible. That's where the research comes in. And then also getting it out into actual product as the technology is becoming um, more prevalent, more mainstreamed. So what we wanted to do in this breakout was to find out um, what are people's experiences and people's suggestions, um, what are ways in which we can help push the research that's being done into practice? So in other words, like what else can XR Access do to really uh, achieve that goal? So I see that people have filled in the participants. Okay, awesome. Um, if you haven't filled in your name, in the participant list, please go ahead and fill it in. Let's make sure that we get everyone here and then we'll do a round of introductions. So the participant list is in the Google Doc. If you scroll down, um, you'll see it's a table. I'll fill my name in as well. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with introductions. Um, I'll uh, finish my introduction. So like I said, my name is Shiri Azamkot and um, I'm a professor at Cornell Tech, which is a Cornell University campus. Um, pronouns are she, her, and uh, I my area is accessibility with a focus on augmented and virtual reality accessibility, um, which is why I co-founded XR Access. So let's go to Randy. So hi, everyone. I'm a physical therapist, clinical physical therapist. I use VR to augment my treatments uh, within uh, uh, my practice. I usually see people with mobility deficits. And uh, I'm neither a researcher or in the uh, other fields. I'm here to sort of uh, try to uh, get some information to help my friends that are in research that are trying to translate to the uh, uh, to, to folks out there that really need this technology. And that's about it. Thank you. Um, so you said you work with people with uh, mobility impairments? Uh, yes, I work with, uh, in, I work in a large university hospital uh, with individuals who have spinal cord injuries, paralysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, John. 
Hello, uh, my name is John Akers, uh, pronouns he, him. I am the Director of Research and Education uh, for the University of Washington Reality Lab. Um, we are a computer science-based uh, research center focused on the intersection of virtual augmented reality. So our primary research interests are computer vision, computer graphics, and human-computer interaction. Um, in, a, in a prior time, I was personally doing uh, XR accessibility research, uh, looking into input standardization, um, but have since moved on kind of more general role. Um, so I'm here hoping to see a little bit more about how we could kind of bring some XR accessibility research back into our own work um, and how we can move it forward. Yeah, that would be great. Um, can you say a little bit about the UW Reality Lab? Yeah, so, um, like I said, we're, we're a research center, so we're, we're based inside of the uh, the Allen School for Computer Science at the university. Um, we're uh, purely industry funded, um, so we have support from Meta, Google, uh, Amazon, and Oppo. Um, but our, our kind of primary area of work that we're doing is looking more at the kind of the foundational technology that comes into uh, XR research. So at a graduate level, we're doing a lot of computer vision research with like 3D reconstruction, um, object detection, um, relighting of scenes. Um, and then I also run our undergraduate research program where we explore more uh, collaborative opportunities with other departments around campus where we actually uh, take AR and VR and apply it to other fields. So things like bringing virtual reality into geology to enable uh, studying of geological sites without being physically present and things like that. Cool. Um, so how many faculty are involved in the lab? Yeah, so we have three uh, primary faculty who are the directors of the lab. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also fund a number of graduate students. Uh, that's kind of our primary functionality is um, we do an annual funding process within our department. Uh, and through that, we've got a network of probably about, I think at this point, eight or nine faculty members um, advising on students that we fund work for. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to talk more about what you guys do throughout the conversation, because it sounds like you have very close ties with um, industry partners. Okay, great. So Owen, on to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Owen McGrath. I work at UC Berkeley in a group called Research, Teaching, and Learning. So we're a service group on the academic computing side. Um, and I've been involved with XR here for five or six years, supporting it in various ways. It's still early at Berkeley. and um, one of the things I've been doing with a colleague is uh, we organized a community practice a couple of years ago um, to both to understand what's going on, but also influence adoption at Berkeley, uh, particularly on the teaching and learning side, where accessibility is you know a core value for us. And so, been tracking things here in XR Access and elsewhere, and trying to bring that back and influence early pilots and even development work as well. Very cool. Um, so are you mostly, you said you're mostly focused on teaching? Well, it's interesting. Um, our group is research, teaching and learning. So we, mm -hmm. we kind of treat that holistically and um, predictably the early adoption of Berkeley is starting on the research side. Mm -hmm. People are doing really interesting things in architect, all different fields, architecture, the humanities. And then they want to bring that into some of their courses. And so it kind of it's kind of that bridging where we want to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Christina. Hi everyone. I am a uh, intern at Columbia and Cornell Tech. Uh, I'm doing research for the accessible art uh, XR. And I'm really interested to see the talk today to see how uh, the research from here can translate to um, professional products. Yeah, Christina is part of our XR Access RE research experience for undergraduates. Uh, Shinyi. Hello, I'm also part of the XR Access program. Um, I'm a current Pomona College student studying computer science and neuroscience. Um, I'm really passionate about um, making sure new technologies and systems are inclusive. And um, I really want to learn more about like making video games accessible. So that's a little bit more about like what I'm interested in. 
Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so I think it would be helpful to start by hearing about people's experiences. Um, if anyone has experience with technology, with research transfer uh, that they'd like to share, or does anybody know of an instance where uh, research was transferred to product and can talk a little bit about it? Hey everyone, this is Dylan, just popping in to uh, check everything's going well. Um, no technical problems, everybody's able to find the Slack and all that okay. How's it going? Hi Dylan. I think we are all good, but awesome. please correct me if anyone is having difficulty. Great, sounds good. Sorry, don't, don't let me interrupt. <laughs> Okay, so back to uh, back to the conversation here. So any instances that you can think of where there's been successful um, transfer of research to product or to practice in some way, um, whether you were involved with, in it or not, um, it'd be interesting to talk about any case studies. I can speak a little bit to um, I think we're kind of a unique position with our lab, but uh, and it's not accessibility related directly, but just kind of That's an fine. example of research in tech. Um, so uh, part of the way that we operate our lab is um, being funded by multiple companies. Um, we are, have a commitment to open source and open IP um, in everything we produce. And so that means all of the research that our, under, our, our graduate students are doing, um, I think they're being directly funded by ends up going uh, all their code gets open sourced, uh, available. Um, and one recent example of that was actually some research we were doing about improving the quality for um, background matting. So for like basically green screening technologies for video feeds, um, specifically thinking about this was kind of at the height of the pandemic at the time, um, everyone being in Zoom or other video conferencing software. Um, so increasing the fidelity of the background uh, matting to the to the foreground. Um, and funny enough, because it was open source, um, without even really talking to us about it, uh, we saw Microsoft actually present about the work and incorporate it into their own production software for their presentation mm. systems, um, which they featured at a couple different like virtual conferences at the time, um, being able to do like full green screening of, of like stage environments. Um, so not really a case of it, it. I think we're in a position with that it's it's hard for us to take things um, into commercial products normally just because we're, we're the intent is for us to be able to release it in a way that anyone has access to it. Yeah, um, that's just kind of an example of what happens as a result is that instead of us being able to turn into product, companies just kind of find these things and pick them up and just incorporate them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so this particular um, research that was done so. It was, it was open sourced. Like there was some kind of prototype or algorithm or something like that that was uh, open sourced, and then Microsoft picked it up without directly communicating with your lab, right? Yeah, the first we found out about it, what they actually, I mean, they gave us a small shout out when they were actually like live during this conference. I think it was the the, the keynote for their build conference. I think. Um, oh, cool. They actually during the introduction were talking about this whole like remote presentation they were doing uh, and then gave us a small shout out during it that they were using some of this technology. And that's when we found out they were actually incorporating it. Yeah, yeah, I have a similar experience. This is also from my days at the University of Washington uh, where I got my PhD. Um, so back then we were working on accessibility of smartphones, of touchscreen smartphones. And this wasn't my project, but it was um, Sean Kane uh, who uh, was one of my lab mates. Uh, so he, along with um, Jeff Bigham and some other folks, they developed a way to interact with a touch screen via voice and touch only for people with visual impairments. And then I think it was maybe a year later, Apple released voiceover, which had some of the same basic elements. So um, they never like explicitly said that they drew from 
that paper that was published, but uh, I think there were some conversations with the accessibility team there and they said that they look at all the research. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's just um, probably in general one of the the unsung things of, of academia research in this in this space is uh, companies don't always acknowledge when they're incorporating some of this work, but they they see value in it. They just don't directly mention it sometimes. Yeah, which is fine, right? Because I think the point of academics is to release to the public, and people working in these various companies are the public. Um, so you know, it's for them as well as anyone else to see and to use. Um, but I'm curious, how much do you think the open source uh, contributed to their to Microsoft adopting this technology um, versus just having a paper or you know some other way of communicating uh, what was done? Yeah, um, I think open sourcing and, and, and computer vision it's a lot more tangible. Um, Provided so so the open sourcing element was actually this is all like the what was happening in the background here was an actual uh, neural network that was doing the recognition for the foreground and the background, um, and so having a tangible model that already existed, mm. I think, did uh, support it in some way. Um, the the ease of kind of transitioning into it instead of having to build something from scratch again. Um, you know, I don't know how much at this point Microsoft has like taken this code base and actually integrated it into the kind of like their core production products, or if this was just kind of a one off to show off, you know, during their own kind of promotion of the direction technology is going. Um, but definitely that the, you know, the time to incorporate goes down immensely when you actually provide the tangible code base versus having to just explain the theoreticals so that someone has to re-implement the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else else have experiences with uh, open source? Well, I'll just chime in going the other way. Um, Microsoft did um, that very well known and pretty amazing seeing VR proof of concept. Yeah. And they put that out on GitHub. And um, I found that to be really helpful and useful for understanding what's possible and thinking about where we would want to see different accessibility features. If you think about the kind of the AR VR ecosystem. So, and they had some great papers that went along with that too. Yeah, so the reason I um, smiled was because Seeing VR was done by my former PhD student, Yu Hong Zhao. That's right. And, uh, hmm? Yes, in fact, um, some of her presentations alerted me to it early on and I had a chance to get to know her a little bit. And, you know, I still go back to that. I think it's, um, it's, it's really, just not just in terms of technical implementation, but it's um, really providing kind of a thought leadership to the whole field. Yeah, yeah, and she really spearheaded that work. I mean, that was that was all her. Um, I mean, she was at Microsoft, but she really ran with the idea. Um, and so, I know that they. Um, and Yuhang has done, and Yuhang, is, when she was working with me, we worked on many other projects. And I think that one of the things that um, made seeing VR so visible, uh, like to the public, was the fact that it was promoted uh, very effectively by Microsoft, right? I mean, I think it's excellent work, but I think she has done other excellent work too. Um, but not all of it has been recognized quite as much as seeing VR. So I think. Um, well, let me, let me make this the question, like what, I mean, it wasn't just the fact that the seeing VR code was online, right? Like there was material that pointed you to that code, right? That's a good point. And, um, and also uh, I was going to raise this at some point. Mm -hmm. um, she, um, she set up a very simple scene for the, rep, for the um, proof of concept. And um, it turns out, you know, you can work from that and learn from that and then start adopting some of the features she developed. And, it, it, you know, I, I wonder if one of the things this field needs is 
those kind of reference implementations because in my experience in other parts of um, software over the years that that can be very useful and also maybe back to John's field um, you know a reference data set type of thing so that we um, are somehow talking together it, it, not in a completely common language but have reference implementation so we can really understand um, how, how something might be implemented um, it doesn't have to be prescriptive and that was one of the things I really liked about seeing VR I think 80 percent of that you could implement in so many different environments it wasn't sort of it wasn't all just like exquisite code a lot of it was just she thought through um, what what needed to be done and then showed that you could do it a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm uh, also supposed to be taking notes, so let me <laughs> let me take some notes on what we just talked about. And um, anyone else should feel free to add to this. I think, I think seeing VR, uh, I'll kind of jump on that, um, is a really interesting one. It's, it's, it's also been uh, kind of the, I would say my, my go-to project to point people towards, and like in terms of like, here's a, a very well-known, I, I would say successful uh, area of research uh, with accessibility and XR in mind. Um, but it was just kind of a, a standalone package that got released, right? And I, I appreciate, absolutely appreciate that, you know, the actual project files got put out there open source, right? So that people could integrate it themselves. Um, but I think to the point about the discussion right now, and I think what I'm kind of most interested in here is um, things like seeing VR, um, how much impact did that have moving forward on like actual integration into, into product, right? First, you know, either, um, you know, maybe there's data out there that I haven't seen, but like, did actual developers use seeing VR, you know, like the dev tools that were provided for Unity um, in their applications? Uh, or similarly, like, did did platforms themselves actually kind of start to integrate these things? You know, I think like one instance of this is that a lot of this was or it was kind of directly tied to Unity. Um, did Unity end up picking up any of these principles or these, you know, there was a toolkit, there was 14 different tools, I believe, right? Um, did Unity actually try to incorporate any of those directly into the engine itself so that this didn't have to be a, a post hoc uh, implementation, but something that could just be built in uh, itself. So I'm curious, you know, how do we, how does, the, how does the research like that actually end up getting incorporated into these technologies? Yeah, I think that, um... My sense, I'm on just one side of this, I'm on the research side, you know, I'm not on the development side, but my sense is that the people who are working on, on developing these technologies, um, you know, they're people just like us, when they're tasked with some feature or some set of features that they need to build, they, you know, Google around for inspiration and or just think about what they've come across um, through conversations, through conferences, you know, whether or not they like remember specifically having heard of it or whether it's just kind of in their memory banks already. Uh, all of those ideas are, they, they incorporate into their new creations, right? I mean, that's just the creative process. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's just it's hard to capture like exactly, you know, where where these sources are coming from, right? Absolutely. The, again, the, what is the what's the tangible effect of the research coming out? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why it helps to have examples. I think um, like this because you can try and kind of analyze like what about these examples has made the difference. It's really hard to know also when you're like publishing papers and you're just kind of putting them out there for the world to see. Uh, you don't know who's reading them, like you're not getting any of that feedback. Yeah, unless you go on like a, a full circuit um, 
think to, to talking about you hung in, I, it sounds like she went to a lot of different campuses then uh, and gave talks about this work. Yes. So just spreading the word as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, John made a really good point. Um, Cause I, I had, I think a lot of people have the same question. Is, is, is Unity or some other major platform going to adopt that and come out with something? And I wonder, I mean, that's probably a question for you, Sherry. Um, this isn't like any other, you know, this isn't like the, the interface wars in the 90s or 80s, you know, trash cans and all that. Because unfortunately, even though we're passionate about this area right now, it's probably not necessarily Unity has so much going on, right? This is not necessarily their priority. Yeah. So I wonder if you thought at all about at what point does sort of the legal and compliance framework have to drive uh, industry's attention and so they do prioritize these sorts of things? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think also like, another related question to that is, you know, should we be thinking about tech transfer differently when it comes to accessibility versus other types of research that could be um, that could have a more direct line towards profits, you know, towards what these companies are ultimately about. And um, I'm not sure what the answer to that. I mean, that's partly why we're doing this deep dive session. Um, but I, I mean, there are regulations in place already that I think um, deserve to be highlighted. For example, like if in order to get a contract from the, the federal government, uh, you, your technology has to be accessible. Um, and it, it's a little more complicated than that, but basically like there are various um, require, accessibility requirements for technologies that are used by, by institutions or organizations that receive a certain amount of uh, government funding. So, and like I said, it's really complicated and I certainly don't know all the details and I think many other people don't know but maybe if that that's made a little bit more explicit, then that might help uh, these companies prioritize the accessibility a little more because it'll help them understand that that could, on a practical level, um, open up some opportunities for them. That's a great point. Um, and I don't wanna take us down that rabbit hole because you're right, that whole compliance policy area is so complicated. Yeah. I deal with that a lot. And and so just to follow on, I, I totally agree with what you said. I almost wonder, and I haven't tapped into this part of XR access, but I, I remember joining early on and there was already some sort of um, liaison connection, for instance, to um, the web standards group. Yeah. One, one, one quick pragmatic approach might be to look at, um, in, in the, on the website, there's the WCAG standard and it has its various success criteria. Some of those could be applied um, right now. Yeah. Because what I find is when you do get it to those vendor relationships and you say, well, it's gotta be accessible and the federal government has not helped very much in this area. Um, they point to WCAG, but they don't require it on the website. But if, if XR access were to start to advocate around some of the basics, captioning, um, color, color contrast, you know, some of the things that you won't showed in her in her amazing um, implementation pick a few of those and then when people do their work they start referencing some of those um, more specifically like pointing towards a WCAG success criteria if it's appropriate because that mm -hmm. I think will get attention and people can start to say well what does it mean to conform yeah I think that's a really good point because WCAG is kind of um there's a lot there. So for the for the students, for Christina and Shinyi, uh, WCAG, WCAG, those are accessible. It's a set of accessibility guidelines for making the web accessible, and it's um, it's a standard. So it's used in any any sort of like legal um, contexts uh, to determine whether something is accessible or not. Um, it's also used uh, by organizations to for compliance, for making sure that uh, websites are accessible. So there's definitely already some work being done on, um, on looking at WCAG and seeing how you can take those 
standards and applying them to XR. I think um, the point you raised is, is really important in that like it's important to focus on just a few of the basics because right now the issue in that I've been running into and like the big question mark in my mind is uh, just how do you WCAG applies to the web and, and even even as it stands like there are all these gray areas and unknowns like WCAG you know you can apply the guidelines to a certain extent but there's still a lot of um, discretion and a lot of um, like unknowns about how exactly to apply them in many contexts. And when you go to XR, we still have no idea about how to make um, XR like 3D environments and interactions accessible, completely accessible to many different types of disabilities. But um, I think you, you're right in that focusing on just a few clear cut guidelines is probably an excellent, an excellent place to start. I think that's a a good point. And then we can go from there. And that's really where the research comes in to build on that. Yeah. And one of the things I'd really like to do in XR Access is to develop guidelines that are um, evidence based, uh, that are based on research. I think, I think related to this as well, and kind of circling back to the, the the topic of this breakout room about you know how how does research actually get transitioned into product? Um, you brought up a good point earlier about you know is, is 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 research and accessibility different than other fields? Where other fields, you know, you might have this like lightning in the bottle of a project where you go, oh my gosh, people could actually you know you could monetize this and you turn it into actual product. But I you know with accessibility, it it is much more we've been echoing this for the last two days i think um is like twisting arms to tell yeah. people like no like you like like yes this is profitable to integrate this because like you need to have accessibility and accessibility actually is beneficial to a, to a product um but as we've kind of been talking about so far the the work and accessibility that does seem to get adopted is the kind that does get open sourced and made available um so really the, the conversation we're kind of having is well how uh, assuming you go the route, you know, you're trying to, you don't, you're, you're being somewhat altruistic and you're not thinking about the, the profits of yourself as a researcher um, commercializing something, but just getting it into products in, you know, actual commercial space. Um, and assuming you're going to do that through open sourcing, what is, you know, what are the guidelines for how you package your research or how do you, you know, format your research in a way where it is in a tangible form that can be easily integrated? into product, right? Assuming you're not trying to create something entirely from scratch, but you're doing something like seeing VR or other plugins or like the green screen work where um, it's being integrated into an existing product. What's the, you know, maybe XR access could be play a role in that of telling researchers, like if you're doing work in the space, here's the best way to kind of formulate your work um, or present it or package it so that it is kind of easily digestible into the actual kind of consumer space. Yeah, so I wonder if we can even take it one step further and say, you know, in XR Access, we, um, we're, we're raising funding, we're raising money to be able to do all the things that we, we'd like to do to fulfill our goals. So I wonder if we could raise some money and develop these mini grants to help people package their research. So let's say, like somebody is doing a research project um, on something related to XR Access, and they've written a paper, you know, they've done like the typical academic thing. Maybe they can apply to XR Access to get like this mini grant that, you know, we can have some kind of graphic designer or, or some, some professionals to help them take their research and turn it into like this website that has a, a demo video and can, you know, um, have like a, a very sort of accessible, accessible, you know, the I'm using that word uh, with a different meaning here, but accessible in the sense it's understandable to the public. Um, I, I've seen companies do this with their projects. And I think it's in my sense is that it's very effective in promoting the project. So what, what do you guys think about that? Do you think that would be interesting, useful um, to you or the people that you work with? I, 
I'd, I'd say definitely. Um, I mean, I know within our lab, uh, again, kind of come to computer vision, which is obviously very visual. Um, it's it's almost kind of like for every project we put out already, we've we've kind of moved away from like the the final piece of the project isn't the paper. The final piece is putting together your project web page, right? Um, where you actually, and again, being open source, the students have to put documentation on their code because it gets publicly released. So they yeah. have to go through that step of you know actually documenting everything, maybe doing some refactoring so it's actually nicely put together, putting an actual web page together with with demonstrations on it, you know, visuals or otherwise, um, maybe extra download links to actual example projects and things like that. Um, but yeah, I do think something like that would be very useful, um, especially when I know academia can be really fast paced once you're actually done with the work yeah, to move right. on to the next one. And what if your students could get like this little mini grant where they could work with an actual designer to help put the web page together so it could save them some time and they could have a better product? Yeah, no, I think that'd be definitely really useful uh, in, in our lab and, and others for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, any other ideas about uh, ways in which we can get um, the research out? What about conferences um, or events? Uh, this is Randy. Uh, so much of uh, what I've experienced is by word of mouth and just mm -hmm. networking. So I think uh, conferences are very helpful in uh, getting the, uh, the research out and possibly finding those um, angel investors to uh, help bring that up into industry. Um, the other thing that I was uh, uh, questioning you folks on is uh, once you have a viable research uh, product, does anybody ever go to several universities and try to get that out to the end users before they try to uh, bring that to the industry? And I was just kind of wondering about that because once again, even with, uh, I do a lot of adaptive gaming as well as VR and so much of that, even adaptive gaming, even though it's much more accessible uh, than VR at this point in time, is so much of that is just by, scanning the uh, the, the uh, websites and uh, the uh, uh, that uh, are known for that uh, service and trying to put piece together the uh, solutions uh, to get it to the actual end users. And I would, um, I would just kind of wondering if uh, people try to do these multi-center or multi-university research projects to try to bring it out in the forefront more so. So my experience is that um, we develop prototypes, but we don't actually get the technology to the point where it can be used by an end user independently. Uh, that requires a lot of engineering work and the PhD students, um, you know, it's not necessarily in their best interest and they don't necessarily have the skill set to do that uh, or, or the, the time, the resources to get from the prototype to the like let's say beta version of a product. So that's why I think it's really important to, to get the, from the prototype stage, to get it to the engineers, to someone who actually is good at developing that, that beta product. Thank you. Yeah, does anyone else have any takes on that? I'd say we don't 
we don't generally do f like formal collaborations with other universities. Um, there's kind of just a informal kind of exchanging of ideas or even less than that, just kind of people, our graduate students will kind of poke around at the other work that's being, you know, published or shared out from other places. Um, so to that extent, there's a little bit of kind of initial reactions and uh, communication, but that I think that is an interesting area is to try to leverage other universities more um, as a way to kind of in essence prototype these ideas. <laughs> Yeah, any other thoughts? <laughs> okay, um, so let's see. So let me review what I have in the notes here. And then I think we get 75 minutes, but we can always end early and have a bit of a break. Actually, there's one more thing I wanted to ask about, uh, social media. Are there any thoughts about the roles of social media? Cause I am kind of, you know, I used to be, I used to use social media to some degree, like I was never an avid user, but now I kind of dropped off my use, so. I would love to be enlightened <laughs> on this topic. And I know that um, Haley brought this up in the panel yesterday um, at the end of the day, the research panel. So do you think there's a role for social media here? Have you used social media to get the word out about research projects? Um, is there anything relating to social media that we should be thinking about for XR accessibility? Uh, once again, this is Randy. I don't know if uh, this is applicable to the question, but I know I use social media all the time to find my end solutions. And I do use universities. I use uh, uh, different websites uh, and uh, Facebook and, and, and all, all kinds of uh, uh, websites to try to find solutions. So for me, it's helpful uh, bring that uh, those solutions to my patients. Um, is it uh, bringing it to the industry? No, but uh, it is helpful to me. No, that's very useful, Randy. Um, what do you, how do you search for things specifically? So <clears throat> uh, GitHub uh, for 3D printing for uh, uh, hardware resources. Um, I also use professional resources. Um, I host a, uh, Innovations Lab at a, 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 a conference called ASKIP where people who have solutions uh, for uh, technology will uh, bring these to light and present them. Um, and I, I utilize that as well. Um, I've utilized uh, places like um, uh, uh, Able Gamers mm -hmm. uh, for resources for, uh, once again, for gaming, not for VR or XR. But uh, those are some of the uh, sites that I specifically uh, try to uh, network with and try to find solutions. I also uh, co-host a, um, or <clears throat> co-chair a uh, group of therapists and, and developers out in actually Washington um, that uh, try to uh, find resources to make XR more uh, accessible for our population as well with motor deficits. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we should connect offline, Randy. That sounds really interesting. Sure. Um, okay, very cool. So social media. So, so you mentioned like GitHub. Um, and what else did you mention? Any other? Um, organizations such as Able Gamers. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, another organization, I'm blanking out on their name right now, they're out of Vancouver, um, uh, British Columbia, that basically uh, just engineer resources for people with disabilities. And some of that, most of that is hardware, it's not software. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
but uh, I'm, I'm blanking out on their name right now. Yeah, no worries. So you but, reach out to them through social media is what you're saying, like yes, Twitter, Facebook. Yes, yeah. through, uh, through their Facebook sites or medicine got it, got it. or whatever. Uh, yeah. And they also have little, uh, 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 well, I shouldn't mention that, but uh, anyway, um, if I remember, if I remember that uh, resource, I will definitely bring it up before this is over today. Okay, cool. Yeah, just as a plug, um, Randy, we're actually looking for the summer REU that we're hosting, the research experience for undergraduates that Christina and Shinya are part of. We're looking for somebody. Um, I think I think we'd like to have somebody who has a motor disability, so an end user who is uh, like passionate about XR, who can help mentor a group of students working on a project relating to XR accessibility. So if you know anyone, um, yeah, I will definitely look into that and see if I can find somebody. Uh, yeah, it's a paid position. We have funding to support this person, so as a consultant. Awesome. Yeah, yeah so I'll that would be. It. That would be great if you do someone. Um, and I can follow up via email uh, after this also. Sure. Uh, OK, so let me review what I have in the notes here that I will report out. Um, so we got together to talk about how we can help push research, specifically research in XR accessibility, into practice. And we talked about um, some examples of research projects that have made it out into the real world as products. Uh, so we talked about the green screen technology from UW Reality Labs, which was adopted by Microsoft, and also um, touch screen accessibility for smartphones uh, that was adopted by Apple in VoiceOver. And then we talked about some of the ways in which research can be made um, more accessible, more visible to the general public. And as part of that, also to these uh, companies that can incorporate it into their products. So we talked about open sourcing technology and the fact that it's really helpful to have um, the code available and data sets and also simple demos that really help people understand what the project is about and what's going on. Um, we talked about the importance of spreading the word through word of mouth. Um, through conferences and social media, so being able to reach out to organizations and other like-minded individuals on social media platforms. And we talked briefly about having a, a way for XR access to provide support for researchers uh, who would like to package their research in a way that makes it um, that makes it more visible and comprehensible to the general public. So whether that's um, giving them a little mini grant or actually uh, partnering them up with a professional like a graphic designer or somebody who can um, facilitate uh, creation of a website and fancy video um, and, oops, sorry, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, anything else that I'm missing that I should add here? So I would like to actually hear from the students. Christina and Xin Yi. Um, what gets you excited about research? How do you learn about research projects? Yeah, honestly, for me, I think it comes from a place where it's like, I love to learn and I love um, the idea of making an impact and like 
um, actually making a difference and um, trying to like um, make it so that people can just like connect with each other and just like live happily. I feel like it's a very, um, um, I don't know how to put it into like words, but this is like what I'm passionate about because um, I really think, um, especially like after COVID and stuff, I'm like really um, driven to like, you know, connecting with other people and um, making technology more accessible and like make it be able to like reach everybody. And so that nobody's like um, left behind. And honestly, like one way to do it is like through research. And it also comes from a place of like just loving to learn and like it's always changing. And um, I like the feeling of being like a little, a little like investigator person and like, uh, like a puzzle slash problem solver. So I feel like this environment makes me really happy. Yeah. Are there any research projects that you've come across that you found exciting? Yeah, right now um, I'm trying to work on a like AI slash computer vision pro uh, um, project. Um, for video games where it's like detecting sprites, like the computer detects the sprites and then it applies like um, <clears throat> like visual settings onto it. Like that being um, for like color blindness or um, on top of that, it's like make it more like other ways of doing it. Like instead of like visually it would like be audio or something like that. I'm still trying to like explore that realm and because I'm not really sure exactly how to go about that process. And I think um, our, our program right now is really helping me get a better feel of this kind of research. Yeah, I'm really excited. Okay, okay, thanks, Jeannie. Christina, um, have you come across any research projects or is there any way that you've like engaged with ongoing research that you found really exciting? Like, have you seen videos? Have you read papers? Like what gets you excited about research out there? Uh, well, the thing that gets me excited about research is just the collaborative uh, nature of it, that so many people can come together and start thinking and come up with new ideas. And you never know what breakthrough can lead to more breakthroughs. So that's something that is very exciting about research. Um, I would say for, uh, the research projects that I've come across is specifically for accessibility, I would think would be, um, uh, it was it was a previous project, uh, I think was done for accessibility and it was, uh, uh, um, it was to help uh, blind uh, gamers how to navigate like a racetrack in a game. And I thought that was very interesting because uh, this, uh, basically, through the research, they found that with the help that they were given, it also made not only uh, blind users better at the game, it also helped even sighted users. They played at the same level. So I thought that was very uh, interesting. And how did you hear, how did you find out about this research? Did you read a paper? Did you see a video? Like, how is it? Um, how did you learn about it? I had come across uh, a video and then I decided to read some more about it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it's the video that got you excited. Yeah, I think um, videos are really important from what I've heard in, in you know, past conversations about tech transfer. Um, people really like having short videos that they can show to like their coworkers and um, that also gets them excited about research projects. So I think that if we do the mini grants, maybe we should focus on videos, on video creation. Um, okay, cool. I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Any final thoughts? I think the, the, the last thing I would say on this, um, I think the approach of XR Access helping researchers make their work more presentable is definitely, I think, the right way to start. Um, if this was a conversation to kind of extend 
Um, I would be curious to hear more from the industry side about, you know, what kind of research do they find is more approachable? Um, it's kind of a, a two-way street in that regard of yeah. how do we, how do we package these things so that they actually can digest it better? Um, but that's kind of the last thought I would add in here. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think we should probably set that as a goal for us, for XR Access internally, to reach out to some of our contacts in industry and talk to them, you know, just do quick little um, sessions with them to see what from their perspective would be most helpful. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, thanks everyone. I think this has been really helpful. So um, really interesting to hear everyone's thoughts. So let me go ahead and stop the recording. And I think there's just five more minutes and then I forget exactly what the agenda for the day is, but at some, I think we, we're going to take a break and then go to the next set of breakouts and only report back at the very end. I believe that that's what is happening. Yes, yeah, I think, yeah. So 15 minute break and then another series of breakout sessions. Okay, awesome. All right, and I will be at the research networking breakout for the next set. So um, I might see you there or um, I'll see you back at the end of the day. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you folks. Thank you for, uh, for writing this.